Hello, welcome to the Talking City podcast, your Manchester City podcast from the Manchester Evening News. My name's Joe Bray, back again after a, uh, well, I would say a fairly routine Champions League win, but it was anything but, wasn't it? It was 2-0 down at half-time against RB Leipzig. City only needed a point to top the group, but it looked like they weren't going to get it. And then uh, a second half turnaround ensured that City do top the group. They are uh, first seeds for the last 16 and they have a game in Belgrade in a couple of weeks where they don't really need to do anything. But um, yeah, that Leipzig game, Simon Bajkowski, wasn't <laughs> wasn't how we thought it would go, was it? It was strange, wasn't it? And, um, you know, I feel like the last time they were 2-0 down at half-time was maybe Tottenham at home. So nice, nice symmetry there. But um, yeah, you turned to me at full-time and said, oh, you know, well, that was, they were always going to win that, weren't they? And I, I really didn't think so. Um, I couldn't see that they were just going to find that winner, but... They won 3-2. They only needed a draw in the first place. Um, but there was kind of enough um, on the night for Pep Guardiola to be a little bit concerned about his team and their level at the moment, which makes it interesting. Yeah, that's. I mean, it's a game of two halves. So that's, and it definitely was on, uh, on Tuesday, wasn't it? It was an awful, awful first half. I said I thought they'd win because as soon as they got that first one and they made the changes... City do that, don't they? The 2 0 de- uh, deficits don't really phase them anymore. But we also said we don't think we've seen them play as bad as they did in that first half for a long time. Probably that Tottenham game in, was it January? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can't remember a press box like that half time. Everyone was just like wide eyed with each other, being like, what have we, what have we seen? What's going on? And like, you know, before anyone starts our oh, negative media, like, Phil Foden says it's the worst he's ever seen them play in the first half. So we can say that because Phil said it. Um, yeah, it was it was bizarre. Like everyone was was off it, um, and the defense in particular. I mean, Rodri wasn't great, sort of shielding the defense, but Ruben Diaz had a nightmare. A Kanji, like just did an error that like a Sunday League defender would be embarrassed by. Um, Walker, Gavardio, like Ortega was in there instead of Edison, couldn't do much with anything. But it, he, they just kind of, they were poor in the attacking third, and then they just let RB Leipzig run loose through them. It was, it was so strange. And and like you know, the second goal, say Diaz gets rolled, um, in like ten fifteen yards into the Leipzig half, but then the fella just goes straight down the pitch, cuts inside Gavardio and scores. Um, and Diaz couldn't make that full challenge because he'd been stupid and got booked before. Um, but even so, I don't think like enough has been spoken of it. But like, yeah, some guy just ran the length of the pitch and scored, and there was like no challenge from City whatsoever. So Diaz was really bad for the goal. But where was everyone else? It was we were just stumped at half time as to you know where where the City team were because they certainly weren't on the pitch. But it's not like they hadn't been won because a Pender's goal in Leipzig was a simple ball through the middle and he was one-on-one with the freedom of the pitch and the goals that they scored I'm trying to remember this conceded against Young Boys haven't they and, and Red, Red Star, Star. Yeah. it's the same goal isn't it in the Champions yeah. League and then Appender does it twice where he gets a free run because the defenders do something stupid or just aren't there I think Guardiola said yeah it is a bit of a concern that they're conceding the same goal it is and it will also be a concern kind of coming only two games after conceding four at Chelsea um, you know the the Liverpool goal was a, a bit of a these things happen, but um, but they didn't defend well against Chelsea and they've not defended well against Leipzig. And you know maybe there was a bit of mentality, feeling like they'd already qualified, and you know a team that goes out to win every game knowing they only needed a draw. Maybe that was a bit behind it. Um, but even if that was behind it, well that's a concern as well because you know, Guardiola needs his players to be on it every game and 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 they weren't. So um yeah, it was it, it was difficult um to watch them and think, are these the team that won the treble? And because the you know the treble was, was built on a phenomenal defence. Um and yeah, it was it was not like the city team that we're used to watching. I should have got the stats up, but it feels like they are conceding a bit more. They they're still winning and, and scoring goals at the other end, but... Yeah, they're not kept many clean sheets at all. I think it's one in the Champions League in five and 
not many, I would say three or four in the Premier League. Um, they're conceding avoidable goals and they're doing avoidable things like Diaz getting that yellow card or um, yeah, Akanji letting the ball through his legs it, or through him. It's um, they, They're doing the basic things wrong and I think maybe like the Liverpool goal was the exception because it wasn't really clear that anyone had done uh, it was a good goal. Yeah, yeah. Um, but for a lot of these goals that they're conceding, they're not defending very well. And that isn't to say that they're not defending well for sort of 88 minutes of a game, but it only needs 30 seconds, 10 seconds of bad defending to concede a goal. So we're seeing them kind of not keep a lot of clean sheets. And you can't always rely on a big comeback. We know City can do it. Yeah, but yeah. one and, day... No, and you can't. And also... Edison has been very good recently um, and Edison has made a lot of saves, more saves than he normally would or has done in the past. So in which case you sort of, they could have conceded even more. <laughs> uh, what, what could happen there? Um, I mean, second half, he makes the changes, doesn't he? He takes off Diaz, who, yeah, had a shocker and he should really got sent off, shouldn't he, just before the break, yeah. the second yellow. Um, Ake comes on. And then we see Doku and Alvarez brought on about five minutes later. Immediately Alvarez is involved and helps Foden feed Haaland one back. And then that's when I'm thinking it's a matter of time because yeah. they were they just looked better. It was, it was a bit like Leipzig away when Alvarez and Doku came on at 1-1, 15 minutes to go and were just a bit more direct and just forced the issue a bit more. Yeah, um, Ake as well was superb. Like, he was great against Liverpool. Um, it's just unfortunate that kind of he pocketed Salah all game, but Salah got free to pass to Alexander Arnold for the goal. But, like, he was really good. And then he was really good again um, when he came on. He sort of, like, he did what Diaz should have done and just kind of, like, took control, met, kept everything calm. Um, and, yeah, uh, Doku and Alvarez certainly helped. Also, Foden... <laughs> Foden really came to the party in the second half, um, but it was it, it was interesting because sort of you, you you watched Haaland all night like running running in behind the defence. There was so often he was like ready to go, and it was Bernardo Silva or someone or like just didn't quite find the pass to him. Um, and it was similar to what Pep was saying on after the Liverpool game. You know, like if De Bruyne or Gundogan had been there, that ball gets played, and then you're talking about a, a sort of a very different night. But for all the problems and concerns that we've identified from that first half, City played like the worst we've seen them play in ages and still beat a team that had already qualified for the last... They, they beat one of the best 16 teams in Europe um, despite having an atrocious 45 minutes. So that tells you how good the team is and how good the team can be. Um, and, you know, credit to to Alvarez, Doku and Ake, but also Foden and, and players who really kind of stepped it up in that second half. I think Manako Rose, the Leipzig manager, came out afterwards and said, yeah, we were 2-0 up, but we made them angry. And we knew at half-time that 2-0 against City doesn't necessarily mean much. It's always that thing when you're playing a really good team, you want to score kind of as late as possible yeah. so they have as little time to, to respond. There was a response from City, but I was still kind of like... Yeah, the the third goal pretty came pretty late, and I I was kind of feeling that City had settled for for two two when they uh, they popped up with that that third goal. But yeah, I mean, again, would Leipzig have played a bit differently if they hadn't already been qualified, or if they'd needed to get something from that game to to qualify? Maybe, um, but that shouldn't kind of take away from from the comeback. I think if you offer Leipzig second place in the group with a game to spare. Yeah, I agree with the with the winners from the season before you. They take that up. Oh, absolutely, and also a Leipzig that have lost like a load of key players over summer. Like always, one of the most interesting clubs in Europe, but particularly this year, um, lost Guardiola and Sabozla and all manner of players, and they're just like not fussed. No, will come come second really easily. You know, could have could have beaten City on the on the night, so they will. I, you know, I think they might surprise some people in the last 16 and maybe maybe push through to the quarters, depending on the draw. Certainly the two toughest games that you've had in, in the group so far. Um, we will leave that there. We'll come back after a short break and discuss a couple of individual performances and uh, a couple of wider bits of City news that we've heard this week.
Hello, welcome back to the Talking City podcast. A uh, couple of individual performances we've touched on. Uh, Ruben Diaz, not great, hooked at half time. He's not sort of reached the heights that he did last season, has he? He's, he's got, it feels like he's having two or three good performances and one not so good. Yeah, although, you know, it should be said that he didn't really hit the heights last season until February. He was out of the team before the World Cup, really, and then he got injured at the World Cup. And it was only February he kind of came back in. Um, so that was kind of, you know, six, seven months of not playing that great or not being at his level. Um, and then he was so good when he came in. It was like, oh, my God, this player's amazing. Um, and he's not, he's not there at the minute. And maybe, you know, to be expected, every player struggles to be consistent for 12 months. Um, and there are some games where he's still excellent, but... Yeah, just a few concentration errors at the minute and things that he's doing that he wouldn't normally would that are making it more difficult to defend, more difficult to keep keep clean sheets. It's not it's not really happening in a vacuum like all the players are doing it as well. Um I thought he was very good against Liverpool actually. But um but yeah, it's it's not quite happening for him all the time. I think with this city defence you can there's so many good players you can't afford to have a, a not so good game sometimes yeah. but on the, on Tuesday Akanji had a not so good game when he let that ball drop and Diaz didn't have a good game and yeah. he's trying to move players around um, we heard from Josco Gradio before the game he was talking about his position and he was saying he kind of said he wants to play centre back but accepts <laughs> that at the moment he's playing left back and then Guardiola comes out and says yeah he's playing left back but not really left back because he's a in, it's basically a back three um, they weren't entirely on the same page but is, is Diaz's form maybe a, a way that Cavadio can get a few more minutes in the centre possibly possibly or is that a reach that... <laughs> well no but then you just think well Ake's playing very well and Ake's left centre back um, but then yeah but then Diaz tends to play left centre back with a kanji so so quite possibly it, it, it's interesting with Cavadio because yeah it was a strange set of press conferences wasn't it because Pep came out and said, "Well, I discovered him playing left back. He, of course, he can play left back, and you know, and it's and it's left centre back anyway." And then Cardio got asked and was kind of a bit like, "Yeah, I'd really like to play centre back and left back. I have to do loads of running, um, but it's all fine." Um, and yeah, I mean, he looks good when he runs forward, but it, he also looks like a player who who wouldn't perhaps like to be doing as much running as he as he is I think he looks all right in that position though like the sort of coming inside and into midfield and he can clearly run, run with the ball can't he he looks like a player that isn't fully aware of where he should be or where everyone else is and that not to sound too harsh but he, he looks like when he's playing he's kind of like thinking oh is there someone behind me that I should maybe be covering or things like that when he's moving forward and um, he, he has been, teams have been able to get at him uh, down that side. So I, I think he would be more comfortable in the middle, but then you can see why um, Pep doesn't feel the need to put him in the middle straight away because he has the players that he can trust in the middle and somebody at left or you know left of a three is kind of less risk than than someone straight in the middle. It's what people have always said about like Kyle Walker, sort of he plays right rather than centre back because you can afford to make more more errors on the wing than you can in the middle because as we saw, like Manu Akanji makes an error in the middle and it it's a really good goal scoring opportunity and it's a goal. Whereas if you do that on the flank, maybe you get away with it because you've got cover in the middle. So so he's being eased in gently. It'll be interesting to see when the move comes to move him into the middle um, if it comes if it comes this se season Chelsea away United away Arsenal away at left back yeah. and he doesn't play against Liverpool but Pep clearly trusts him to some degree at left back yeah 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 um, well he's a very good defender and you know he costs 78 million and Leipzig Leipzig absolutely love him so yeah there's plenty of um, good qualities that he has brought and also let's not forget he's only 21 uh, I think 21, 22, 21, I think. Um, so he is st still young and, you know, listening to him in his press conference, like he is still green, 
to City and he's um, he's still getting to grips with everything. So it will take time. He won't get everything immediately, but he, he's already made a really good impression. I quite liked his press conference because he, he didn't just give you the stock answers. He, he took a couple of seconds to listen to the question think right what do i want to say and yeah, yeah maybe they'll train that out of him but. well yeah, yeah yeah but not in his first language he's like it, it's like diaz is one who is like his english is incredible and he can pick up idioms and he uses them and like we we kind of never lose sight of how impressive it is when we're talking to these guys and it isn't their first language and they can just use it so so freely and gradual as well just he was really engaged when he talked and he got the questions and and we've spoken to him a few times since he joined and and that was by far the most engaged and the most relaxed he's yeah. he's been and the you know the the best he's been from our point of view in terms of being interesting so um so yeah, good a good few days for him. Another sort of young green player, Jeremy Doku, comes off the bench again, changes the game against Leipzig. It, like we said, it was a little bit similar to the away game, but is he getting to the point where he's either undroppable or the player that you turn to when you need something to happen? Uh, yes, yeah. I, I don't want to like get you off on Jeremy Doku. No, again, no, but... no. But it's it's a very interesting thing because I would say, yeah, he he's. He is getting to that point where either you have to start him or you have to consider him as a player to come off the bench. But then if he is that player off the bench and he's not undroppable, is he? It's um, yeah. it, you, you sort of you have to use him, but it's one of those where you sort of have to say to make clear like, look, being on the bench is not like a a punishment or it's not someone that's better than you. It's you feel like he's going to do something every The day. best use of you is 30 minutes at the end of the game or things like that. But you, you do feel like he's going to do something. And it kind of, um, it should fire up Grealish because Grealish was part of the sort of first half malaise where every time he got the ball, he just didn't really want to do enough with it. There wasn't enough drive. It was all safe football. Um, and he gets taken off in the second half and Doku co comes on and instantly shows what what was needed to kind of lift the game. Um, and Grealish has been in that position before. Like last season, I think Chelsea, when he came on, he was more urge he showed more urgency than he had done in recent games when everyone had been getting on his back saying, why are Grealish and Mahrez playing? They're so slow. They never go forward. And then they just said, you know, we can do that and we are doing and we've seen that this season from Grealish, but if Doku is always there, Grealish always needs to be there and can't afford to have a game where he is off it or, you know, play takes the safe options too too often. So so Doku gave a performance that said, Yeah, play me anytime, any minutes you like, and I will do that and it's gonna cause problems for, for defenders. It was it, it was very very bright, very good. I feel like we're not quite there yet, but we're going to get to a stage where they're pushing each other in a really healthy way. Yeah, and well, they were a few weeks ago, yeah. yeah. It was like, it, that is what you want from them. And also you want them to be, you want them both to be so good that they can play in the same team together because not only are they pushing each other, but you've got to say, well, actually, you both deserve to play, so you both will play. Um, and that should keep the likes of Alvarez and Foden kind of, to keep their level as well. So, yeah, it, it's good. Grealish and kind of swung it a bit his way and now Doku swung it swung it his way. So, you know, if you're talking about who should start against Tottenham, then you'd have to say it's it's Doku's to lose, really. But then it's interesting on the other side where you've got Kyle Walker pushing up and Bernardo or Foden coming inside and then you, there's now options where you can change it within a game. If you need both of Doku and Grealish on the wings, you can do. If you need a bit more direct, you can ask Foden to go as well and... Or if you want a bit of control, like he has done so often, he can go Grealish and Bernardo. And it's something maybe that didn't have as much last season in terms of options that can change within the game as well. Yeah, yeah. They've certainly become kind of more more fluid than ever. Um, helped by the likes of Bernardo Silva and Foden, who can just play any position on the, on the pitch, I think. Um, and yeah, that, that will that will help. Silva's been kind of helping out on the left a bit in recent games and wasn't on on Tuesday night and that was kind of felt 
Um, you know, he looks a bit isolated on the right wing rather than he's been playing more central and left. Um, and the left didn't look as good without him. So, again, that's a reminder to whoever is on the wing to be like, look, you can't rely on Bernardo necessarily. You've got to, um, got to instigate things yourself. I think the, I mean, the impression I got was Bernardo was so good hugging the touchline in Leipzig to allow Lewis to do what he did in that game. But there were two things. I think Leipzig responded to that and also it's a different game. So City were probably playing on the break a little bit more, but Leipzig were just sort of played it a bit more cautious and, and playing on the break themselves. So that tactic wasn't as effective. Just before we finish this this half, Jack Grealish, a couple of nice community stories this week, uh, just showing again that he's just a really good good ambassador when it comes to that sort of thing. He is lovely off the pitch and he does a hell of a lot of work kind of for similar causes that, you know, he doesn't shout about or anything like that. He just does it because he, he genuinely cares. And it's kind of nice because... You know, footballers have very busy lives and also they can't... You'll often find a footballer with a cause that matters to them or things like that, but they can't have... They can't care about everything um, because there's just too much too much going on. But it, it's always nice that Grealish, with all his other commitments commercially and things like that, you know, finds finds time and, and is happy to, to do these sort of things to help in the community and help people who... Um, you know, for whom him being there will be a really big deal and make a difference to them. Yeah, you see the faces of the, the sort of the kids that he's surprising and doing treats for, and like you can tell that they will remember that for yeah, the rest of their lives. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's not something that turns off when the cameras turn off either. You know, people who've sort of been with Grealish and say, you know, he, he will go above and beyond and spend time and. And he does, you know, keep things up. There was that thing last year with the World Cup where he met Finlay, the the young fan, and um, promised to do his celebration if he scored at the World Cup, and then he does it. And it, it's, you know, for, again, for someone who whose brain must be going at a million miles an hour when the football is on to, to remember those things it is it is really nice that he's got those at kind of the forefront of his of his mind when they don't need to be. Absolutely. We'll uh, back after another short break to discuss Tottenham uh, and a couple of other things uh, that we've left to the last minute of this podcast. Hello, welcome back to part three of the Talking City podcast. Before we get to Tottenham, uh, Simon, a report this week that a trial date has been set for City's big showdown with the Premier League, potentially autumn 2024 verdict, summer 2025. City is saying nothing, Premier League is saying nothing, just like last week with the Everton uh, punishment, nothing has changed, but does it sort of underline that this is not going to be a, a quick resolution with the with the charges? Yeah, it's always nice when something like that comes out and you're like, yes, that is what was expected and, you know, what we had kind of thought it, it had to be. Um, yes, yeah, during the mail, wasn't it, saying late 2024 with a verdict, end of the 24-25 season. Um, we, and it kind of shows how starved we are for information in this case that anything is like clung to and clutched to and, and is a big deal and it is a very, very big case. Um, it's, yeah, a long time away. Um, but also it probably helps City and it probably helps other people to um, for those kind of dates to be there because then, you know, Premier League, every whenever every, every other club goes to them and says, what's happening with this City case? Why, where do you, you say, right, well, it's at the end there. We're working towards that and then it will happen then and it is a long time away, but it will, it is a hugely complex case and a huge significant case you know it's if if a, a murder trial was taking its time in the criminal you would say oh where are you up can we just know if he's guilty or not Dep doesn't matter about all the evidence just sort of decide on what you've got just won't happen so um it's proper that it takes the right amount of time to to do it and also maybe the fact that it's been set will help sort of push away those people who are saying oh well City are just delaying City are just using their lawyers to 
to, to delay like no they are working towards something and they have got time frames so um yeah a, a positive thing i think but if everton have had to produce what was it forty thousand documents to sort of defend their own case then if city have 114 more charges and it's going to be longer it's going to take longer and uh, i mean yeah if it is summer 2025 that is coincides with the end of pep guardiola's contract it's not new information that he will have to make the decision of whether he stays or goes depending on what what happens but that could be a bit of an interesting summer now with uh, a club world cup a uh, potential potential verdict and guardiola's future to be decided yeah well i mean i was off yesterday so you tell me you tell me why it's an interesting summer. That's you having talked too much in this uh, <laughs> podcast, isn't it? Uh, well, yeah, it's just, uh, again, not new information, but Guardiola will have to either extend knowing where what City's punishment is, if they are punished or not, uh, or make the risk of City could be punished and what does he do? And he said he'll go down to League One and, and the National League, which I would not recommend. <laughs> having seen Michael go down to the National League uh, yeah. getting beat off at Emsfleet is not not fun <laughs> but uh, if Guardiola wants to do it it, it's, it puts City in an awkward position and it puts Guardiola in an awkward position because if he was thinking of leaving in 2025 it, it's far more awkward for City to attract a manager to say come and manage us and you will either be taking hold of you know, the the best team in Europe who just won the Champions League for a fourth straight year. Football and, Cup Champions. Yeah, yeah. Or you will be taking charge of a squad who all want out because they've been relegated four leagues and they, you know, um, it's not quite the job that you thought it was. Now, there are, of course, a range of things that could happen between that. But it, I think we're at the point where either the most serious things are proven and it's terrible news for City or the most serious things aren't proven and nothing effectively happens to them. Um, you know, beyond fines for some of the some of the lesser non-cooperative stuff. Um, so that is all easier if Guardiola says, I'm staying because you don't have to sort of, you don't have to have a plan A and B almost of... Um, you know, well, we we would like to hire Roberto De Zerbi, but we've got Stuart Pearce on standby in case we go down four leagues or things like that, um, to know that Pep will be there, whatever. But it's a big thing for Pep to... It, I'm sure Pep doesn't want his future and what he does with his future determined by, you know, something that has had nothing to do with him. Well, I know City loved the trip to uh, Cheltenham a couple of years ago and that is a that's like Wembley compared to some of the the National League stadiums so uh, he'll have a field day down there let's get back to this weekend City versus Spurs a few weeks ago this was going to be a, a proper ding dong wasn't it but Spurs have had a couple of big injuries a couple of bad results City should be winning this one should be winning this one yeah um, City on the back of a few not bad results but you know it's not often that they don't win they, they go two games without winning. They certainly won't want to go three games without winning because they've they've dropped points against Chelsea and Liverpool. So it's important that they get back to winning ways and far more likely to do that against the Spurs team that are ravaged by injuries and suspensions than the Spurs team that were kind of running away with things at the at the beginning of the season. I think you mentioned it at the start. There will be comparisons to the the last home game where City were two 0 down at half time, came back one four two. Guardiola goes on his big happy flowers rant, and that was a, any sort of look back on the treble winning season will use that as a turning point, won't it? But that's what we're nearly a year on, we'll be able to see how, how much City have learned, what they've changed, that sort of thing. Whether that attitude is still there, and having gone two 0 down at half time in the last game. It, yeah, it was mentioned, wasn't it? Yeah, well, it's interesting because that these sort of warning signs from the last few games that say, oh, maybe the level isn't quite at it, and um, you know that you can't be at it for twelve months. But it, City weren't at it for enough last season that Guardiola had had enough. And you know, also important to say that he sort of admitted afterwards he probably wouldn't have said it if they'd lost. Yeah. 
So it was only because they came back and won that he felt enabled to really tear into everyone. Um, it's it, it was a huge moment in in the treble. And City Spurs games tend to be kind of more significant than your average game. There just tends to be quite a lot a lot going on. Um, so it will be good to see, hopefully, another very good game of football between two sides who who like to play football and and two two good clubs. You know, I was on um, a Tottenham podcast this week and and they were sort of talking about you know similar histories of City and Tottenham of like you know really big historic clubs with really rich histories, but also kind of have been in the shadow of a very close neighbour for for a long time but when they come together they seem to bring the best out of each other and um, and really put on a show um, and you think back to like the you know the Peter Crouch goal when Spurs kept City from being in the Champions League and then you've had the uh, obviously the Champions League quarter final that was very painful for City and um and then all those games at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. So, so Spurs kind of have had a lot of joy against City, but also there've been some some great City memories against against Spurs. Um, you know, going back to like the Ballet on Ice with Summerby Lee and and Bell, who were unveiled this week with a statue, weren't they? So, um, yeah, there's there's always a lot going on, and maybe there'll be less going on than there was at the time of the Happy Flowers, but. Um, I think it, the, we still won't be short of talking points. I think even though they've got the, the, their injuries, the way that Postacoglu's got them playing, we saw that high line against Chelsea that we were still talking about the other day. And I think it will lend itself to quite an end-to-end game. And if City aren't necessarily at the best defensively, then uh, it could be could be another good game. Yeah, I mean, Son is a player who is a bit like kryptonite for City, just finds a way to, to score against them and, and excel against them. So um, he will have to be kept very quiet. Diaz or whoever plays will have to be on their on their A game to keep him quiet. I'd love to see if uh, Guardiola has remembered who Pedro Poro is as well. Um, I don't think it'll be the best City Tottenham game this season though because the away game is scheduled for the se- FA Cup semi-final weekend and by my working out the only other time they could play it is the second to last game of the season. So if City have to go to the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium with a penultimate game in the last week of the season, yeah. potentially in to win. Um, and ultimately, as we know, they will lose 1-0. <laughs> so we, we could already kind of write that write that script now. So, um, yeah, I, th- I think it will... I mean, it, City have to make their home advantage work because they can't know for sure that they'll be as good away. And certainly away at Spurs, they, they, they're just not good. So um, they need these three points ahead of another tricky away game at Villa in a in a few days. So they they can't really afford to to go a third game without winning. Get a score prediction from you. I think it'd be four one, four four one, four two, four one. I was to say four three. I'm I'm expecting goals. So yeah, nil 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 one. <laughs> <laughs> And um, before we go, uh, we have the new Footballer of the Year uh, competition running, which is an award that's been running for the last few years. Uh, throughout our titles, uh, obviously Erling Haaland is up for the main award, but uh, after his incredible season, he does have some stiff competition. Um, I should look at who, who else is. I think Rodri and John Stones are also on that list. Um, I was then asked to do the City Player of the Year nominations, and I didn't put John Stones in, but uh, it's quite hard after Haaland, I think. It, well, it is hard, hard for Stones. Like Stones was incredible for like three months. Um, yeah, like that Champions League final performance will be an all timer. But but he's missed like the whole of this season, so it, it's quite hard to say someone's had like an amazing year. And at, at the same time, like you know. A, don't think Haaland got nominated in the like November um, Premier League Player of the Month and whatever, and it like, he scored more goals than anyone else. But he's he just like, I was just like, oh yeah, that's Haaland. It's his standard, like, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, he scored like forty goals in three games, but but this guy scored two in four. So well done him. And it is like, 
yeah, it, Haaland is so far above anyone else. It, it's difficult to... And you can say, yeah, Rodri's played tremendous all season and, you know, I'm sure you can make an argument to say Rodri is more important than, than Haaland is to the team. Um, but it does feel like Haaland's that... It, it's been Haaland's season and Haaland's year. I'm sure we'll have uh, more in-depth discussion about this, but I will offer a word, word of warning that Riyad Mahrez won the City <laughs> Award a couple of years ago when he was he had a very good season, but it was not better than Kevin De Bruyne. So, but he has a lot more individual fans. So, uh, if you think Haaland has uh, maybe Alvarez will win it then. Well, he's not afraid he's not nominated oh. uh, for the main award. We have Haaland, Jude Bellingham, Rodri, John Stones, Declan Rice, Mary Earp, Sam Kerr. Bakayo Saka, Harry Kane, Mohamed Salah, Ollie Watkins and Kieran Trippier. And then for the City Player of the Year, we have Haaland and Rodri and Bernardo Silva and I put Jack Grealish, which I feel like lends it. Sort of- well, Grealish, was, Grealish was great from like January to April. But that main award, like again, like Bellingham has had a phenomenal start um, at Real Madrid. And if you're doing from August to now, then yeah, he's probably bang up there. Is he up there from January to now? Like, was he amazing the second half of the season at Dortmund? Was he doing amazing things as they sort of, dare we say, bottled the league? I think we definitely say they bottled the league. Like, yeah, it, it, it's always difficult in these awards not to kind of get swept up in the moment. But when you kind of step back and take a, a wider glance at it, um, there is there is one man who scored more goals than everyone else. Well, this is it. I was nominating Haaland and I was like, well, he's obviously going to win, but here are three others. Yeah. Uh, and he's won a lot of awards but this will be by far the most prestigious even when he wins it um, go on the Manchester Evening News website for all the details on that and how to vote uh, you can find us on Twitter Facebook YouTube TikTok wherever you would expect to find us we are there please subscribe su- subscribe and leave a five star re- review if you like what we're talking about over here um, and I'm afraid again we've had some works outside so you've heard, so, heard some uh uh, bangs outside that is uh, what it is but uh, yeah we'll be back after the uh, Tottenham game City are off to Aston Villa next week and uh, Luton so the, the the games are keeping on coming and uh, they're not easy by any stretch so uh, let's see how City do against Tottenham and we will be back next week thanks for joining us